Okay, yeah. wonderful. I'll just tell you that we see. Sorry to interrupt you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's two o'clock, so we'll make a start. My name, my name is Brigitte Caronia, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this seminar, which is hosted by the Center for International Law at the Institute for International Relations in Prague. So today we're going to hear from Gillian Kane, a PhD candidate at the School of Law in Queen's University, Belfast. And Gillian's going to present her research project, which assesses the role of international law in preventing and tackling human trafficking uh, among refugees and asylum seeker, uh, seekers. And Gillian's project combines her research interests of public international law generally, as well as international human rights law and refugee law specifically. And aside from her PhD research, Gillian teaches EU law tutorials at Queen, Queen's University Belfast School of Law, and she's an active member of the school's PhD research network and the Queen's University Belfast Human Rights Centre Human Trafficking Research Network. Beyond academia, Gillian is an academic coordinator for Network for Migration Matters and is soon to join the board of Chabdai UK. So just before we start, a few practical considerations. Shortly, I'll hand over to Gillian, who will share her screen with you and present for roughly 30 minutes. And as you're aware, this event is being screened live on Facebook. So please feel free at any time to submit questions in the comment box on the Facebook page. And I'll pass them on to Gillian after her presentation um, so we can have a discussion. And we hope to finish up in about an hour's time. So without further delay, I'll hand over to Gillian and I look forward to our discussions. Thank you very much, Bridge. I will just share my screen now and you can let me know if you can see it. Um, I'm sorry, now, can you see it? We can see, thanks Gillian. Brilliant, thank you, Bridge. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to be able to join with everyone today, even if I can't be with you in Prague. I want to thank Bridge and Teresa and the team at the Institute for the warm welcome and the opportunity to speak about my PhD research, uh, which I've been working on for the last couple of years and which is slowly edging towards a close. Nevertheless, it is still very much a work in progress. So what I'll share today represents an overview of what I've been working on, uh, why it's necessary to look at this issue and really a little bit about the picture that's emerging from my research. So looking forward to your input questions and comments and, and really hoping for a very valuable exchange here today. <clears throat> so human trafficking, refugees, international law, what is this all about? When it comes to human trafficking and refugees, where are the connections and convergences and how is this normally approached? Well, one area where human trafficking and refugee and asylum issues may be and actually has been considered together are situations where trafficked persons have a valid, valid asylum claim based on their trafficking experience. In other words, a situation amounting to trafficking in their case would satisfy the definition of a refugee. I'm just going to check the chat as I see maybe there is a message. I'm just hoping you can he hear me. Yes, always good. <laughs> um, this that I've just described is an important and peripheral aspect of my research. But what I'm focusing on more centrally in my research are situations where an individual is essentially fleeing one harm only to arrive in another. In other words, but for their asylum journey and asylum experience, they may not have been trafficked. So here we have situations where individuals are expecting, hoping, asking for protection abroad because they could not find it at home and they're potentially at risk of or experience trafficking. That's the problem that I'm looking at in my research in particular and from the perspective of international law. Before I look at what exactly the problem is and the question of why looking at it from the perspective of international law, just a brief overview of what I hope to cover during this presentation. So first of all, defining key concepts. I'm aware that maybe not everyone will be as familiar with the concepts that I will talk about today. So we'll give a brief overview of how these concepts are defined in international law. Then moving to framing the issue. What is the problem of human trafficking in the asylum context? What does it look like? What is the nature of it? 
then moving to why international law, a little bit about the scope of this research and methodology, and then a broad overview of the three areas of international law under analysis in my thesis, international anti-trafficking law, refugee and asylum law, and human rights law. Obviously, given the time today, this is going to be more of the broad strokes and some of the key findings and key aspects of this. Moving then, given the comparative international law focus to the domestic plane. And finally, looking a little bit at the emerging picture. As I say, I'm still very much forming these conclusions. So this again is very much the broad strokes. So turning to the concepts, what is human trafficking? Well, as many of you will know, the international legal definition is contained in the Palermo Protocol, which is a protocol to the UN Convention on Transnational Organised Crime. And it's been replicated almost word for word in regional instruments, domestic instruments um, across the world. And within that definition, it's commonly accepted that there are three elements which need to be cumulatively fulfilled in order to have a situation of human trafficking. These are an act, so recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, receipt of persons, a means, threat or use of force, other forms of coercion. We see other abusive means here, abusive power, etc and a purpose, exploitation. Exploitation is defined here in this article, but it's a non-exhaustive list. So really the key is exploitation. There are other qualifications in this article, including that for children, those under 18, there only needs to be an act and a purpose element. Also, if we think about this definition in light of cross-border migratory movements, in fact, there is no requirement that we need cross-border migration for an act to amount to human trafficking. I think it's really important to keep that in mind when we think about the asylum context, that we're not just talking about a journey or crossing a border, but actually the whole process. Moving then to the concept of a refugee. Who is a refugee? Well, the, the definition of a refugee, as many of you all know, is contained in Article 1A2 of the 1951 Convention. And here we see that a refugee is someone who has a well-founded fear of being persecuted for a number of reasons, race, religion, etc., outside the country of their nationality, unable or unwilling to avail of protection and, and return. That is who a refugee is. We do see a broadening of this scope in the regional context in Africa. Um, so here we see that the, the regional African convention that governs uh, refugees saying, it also applies, as well as this, it also applies to those who, so things like external aggression, occupation, foreign dom domination, and events seriously disturbing public order. So we see a broadening of protection in that region. In Europe, we also see a broadening of protection, but in a slightly different way within the EU. Instead of broadening the refugee category, we see an additional protective category that captures some of those things, and that's the category of subsidiary protection which has slightly less rights attached to it, um, but still is a broadening regional approach. Finally, asylum seeker. I put quite a simplistic um, de description of an asylum seeker on the screen, but I think it, it really captures the essence of what I mean by asylum seekers. It's offered by UNHCR, and that is an asylum seeker is someone whose request for sanctuary has yet to be processed. Someone who's seeking, uh, attempting to get international protection has maybe registered in the process but haven't had a decision so it doesn't mean they're not a refugee just they haven't been recognized or um, rejected as such. So after that whistle stop uh, tour through the key concepts hopefully that helps bring some clarity if you were not familiar with some of these concepts I'm now going to turn to the problem. Refugees and human trafficking what is the problem why is it a problem and why is it worth studying from any perspective at all, let alone international law? Well, UNHCR data estimates that there are 26 million refugees and 4.2 million asylum seekers worldwide. And among this quite sizable population, we can see known risk factors for trafficking. That is on the basis of what is known about trafficking risk and then what is known about situation and circumstances of refugees and asylum seekers on their journey and at destination. Now, while data is important here, I want to draw attention to the concept of the seductions of quantification, as the late Engel Mary has spoken about. And actually, that is quite tricky to know how accurate data on human trafficking will be. There are numerous challenges to measuring trafficking, among them the fact that we, we don't know what we don't know, 
We don't know how much is hidden. We don't always know what is being measured. Um, and so while data is useful and certainly has a role to play, I also think it's important to look for evidence of known risk factors of trafficking from the trafficking literature and also what is known about um, the asylum process journey and, and conditions at destination. And when we look at that, what we see is that there are risk factors and also the reality of trafficking observable across the process um, and also across geographical and cultural contexts. We also see a link with dangerous journeys and in particular in journeys that involve smuggling. Now just a note on what I mean by across the process. Um, this is again a rather simplistic diagram of the asylum process, the red lines being you know, the change between one country and another. Um, as I say, you know, every asylum journey is, is, is complex, and um, so there's no one size fits all, but this just shows you the various different stages that we're not just talking about a journey and somebody arrives, but actually it can be a long process through a transit country, within a jurisdiction, through the application, and then even the outcomes when, when someone has received legal protection, there are still challenges and risks there. And then obviously when an, a, a a decision is being made or an application fails, the appeals process and removal decisions, you know, just questions of whether trafficking risk is really considered there at all um, are, are key questions. So when we talk about process, this is what we're talking about. And I think the research is certainly indicates that there is risk and the reality of trafficking really observable across all stages of this. So in light of all of this, my argument is that if the aspiration to fight end or abolish trafficking, as we often hear this, this narrative and this rhetoric from states, NGOs, civil society, individuals, if this aspiration is to succeed, then responses need to be able to function in the asylum context. Um, of course, they need to be able to function elsewhere, but certainly in the asylum context. Now, this is a complex problem and there are many responses needed, it's multifaceted, legal and non-legal approaches needed, I do acknowledge that. And international law is, is just one response, just one legal response, it's not even the only legal response. And I conceptualize it as just one potential tool in the overall toolbox of potential responses to this problem. It is there, it is a tool, and I think it's important that we know its shape, its facets, what it can be used for, what it can't be used for, how we can use it more effectively. And that's really the aim of what I am trying to do. So with that in mind, let's turn to what the overall focus of my research is. So the overall focus we can see is an assessment of the role of international law in preventing and tackling trafficking among refugees and asylum seekers in Africa and Europe. <clears throat> Already in this uh, title uh, overview, we can see some indications as to scope, but I just think it's important to, to talk about where the parameters have been drawn in terms of scope in this research. So international law, um, I am focusing on the three main areas of international law that have most relevance to this problem. That is anti-trafficking law, refugee and asylum law, and human rights law. Obviously there are you know, other areas of international law that have a more peripheral role but they fall outside the scope of this research. I'm looking at human trafficking among refugees and asylum seekers as defined earlier in the presentation. That's not to say that other displaced persons and in particular internally displaced persons don't experience the risk and reality of trafficking. They certainly do. And I think that, that definitely warrants um, investigation, but it raises discrete and, and different, different uh, questions as well. And also engages different areas of international law. Um, for example, humanitarian law. So I think I, uh, the scope really is, is people who have left uh, their country of origin. I'm also looking at the regional approaches, but in Africa and Europe only. So impossible to look at regional approaches from every region. And then within that, um, domestic approaches that are representative and have been selected to sort of represent um, the, the regions. But there also are some limits to that as well, which we'll, we'll chat about a bit later um, if time permits. That scope methodology here, um, sort of a combination of approaches. There definitely is a lot of doctrinal research going on here in terms of the content of the international law and how it's interpreted and, and um, yeah, just, just its, its scope. Um, there's a socio-legal element in the sense of, there's a number of authors that, that sort of frame socio-legal um, in a broad sense in terms of an inter interface with the, the context within which the law operates. And really I've taken, <clears throat> 
a lot of time to to think about what the problem is rather than what the problem is perceived to be and um, so that's really where the socio-legal element comes in and then comparative international law and this is an emerging methodology and it really quite strongly underpins my re research and because of that I just want to take a few minutes to talk about comparative international law. So what is comparative international law? It is a bit different from comparative law as the focus is comparing how international law behaves in different contexts. Um, Anthea Roberts and some others who are really driving this field forward have um, put forward a broad definition. Certainly I would say the parameters I think it's accepted are not fixed yet. Um, but they say that comparative international law entails identifying, analysing and explaining similarities and differences in how actors in different legal systems understand, interpret, apply and approach international law. So we can see this broad definition and I think it's clear from this that comparative international law inquiry can look like a number of things. Um, these authors accept that it could be comparing how different international tribunals interpret and apply international law, but also how different domestic actors um, interpret and apply and, and approach international law. And I think the added value, I would say, of a comparative international law approach is this more holistic understanding of the role played by international law. Then we're not just taking it at face value of its content, but we're actually looking at how it interacts with other systems, looking at how it behaves once it enters the domestic system and comparing that across diverse contexts. Um, some of the theoretical you know, underpinnings of, of these kind of approaches are, again, from Anthea Roberts, her work on is international law, international in the sense that these norms might be global in application, but not always universally you know, uh, in, interacted with and understood. And, and that's not to say that difference is a problem, but just a more holistic understanding of exactly what international law's role is. And that's really the comparative aspect of this. That being said, I very much take the approach that content matters. So we do give considerable time to investigate the content of the three main frameworks in focus. And it's to these frameworks that we are gonna turn now. Now the lens through which I've assessed these branches of law is that of their capacity to impact upon the problem in focus, human trafficking among refugees and asylum seekers. I'll also briefly look at some of the interactions between these regimes. Now, it won't be possible to go into detail into each of these frameworks, so rather I'm painting a broad picture here today. And while in my uh, PhD research I do look into soft law instruments, the instruments I've listed in today's presentations are limited to sort of binding treaty norms. So turning to the first field, international anti-trafficking law, we can see the main legal instruments here on the screen. At the global level, we have the Palermo Protocol, um, which is um, we've discussed earlier, contains the legal definition of trafficking. At the European level, a very similar instrument, the Council of Europe Convention, ECAT, also EU level directives. And in Africa, I wanted to point out a really interesting instrument that I don't know um, how widely this is known. Um, it's got a very long name, short name being the Malabo Protocol. And this is an international criminal law instrument and while it doesn't address trafficking specifically, it does contain a definition of trafficking. It's a really interesting approach because it's the first um, international instrument that actually considers trafficking in itself as an international crime rather than, say, as an element of a crime against humanity. Really, really interesting. And though it's not yet in force, it will be really interesting to see how that is advanced in the future. And just really wanted to draw attention to that novel approach um, within the African region to uh, addressing human trafficking under the auspices of international criminal law. So what can be said about the content of these instruments in view of their capacity to address trafficking among refugees and asylum seekers? First, it should be acknowledged that none of these instruments or obligations have a specific focus on refugees and asylum seekers. Nevertheless, within them, there is certainly the potential to be effective in all contexts including the asylum context. So let's look at the definition, the act means purpose definition that we looked at earlier. To what extent could we say that it is fit for purpose in the asylum context? Well, the wide range of acts, means, and an open-ended list uh, concept of exploitation 
means that this definition seems capable of capturing a wide range of exploitation which takes place across the asylum context. To note just one example, it would mean that processes leading to exploitation which take place within refugee camps, reception centres or even detention centres could potentially fall within the scope of the trafficking definition. Now, given the protection owed to those identified as falling within the scope of that definition and the obligations to prevent conduct from falling within the scope of that definition, the potential breadth is therefore far from insignificant. Nevertheless, problems do remain, perhaps the most significant of which concerns the trafficking smuggling nexus. I know we haven't talked so much about smuggling today, but smuggling is essentially defined as, as, as paying someone to, to, to be transported illegally across a border. And actually, perhaps it is among refugees and asylum seekers that this complexity is most ob obvious and that the limits of the legal and conceptual distinctions between trafficking and smuggling become apparent. The differences are subtle, and it is perhaps the grey areas of asylum journeys which do not fit neatly into either definition, even with a broad approach to the trafficking definition. And the consequences of this are that those individuals who fall outside of the scope of the trafficking definition, even when they've experienced harm in the journey, don't have any recourse to protections offered by these frameworks. And this seems to me to be a limit of this definition in the asylum context. Beyond this, there are a number of protection and prevention obligations um, in the global and European context only. Obviously, just with the nature of the Malabo Protocol, it's a little bit different. The extent to which the potential within these articles could provide effective protection within a domestic system would, of course, depend on how seriously they're taken by state and how much they are considered in the asylum context. Nevertheless, there are steps which could be taken at the international level, which would assist in improving the potential of these obligations. Um, and that, you know, it could be, for example, the pursuit of clarity regarding what compliance with some of these protection obligations um, in the asylum context would entail. And I just want to draw your attention to the creation of Greta under the uh, European, the Council of Europe Convention created by Article 36 of ECAT. It's a group of experts. It's a sort of international institutional body. And Greta really has done really great work in, in monitoring uh, compliance with uh, this instrument and um, has done a really good job of drawing those vital connections between trafficking and asylum. I think just last week, there was a Greta report um, on COVID and trafficking, and again, identifying um, trafficking among refugees and asylum seekers also urgent procedures by Greta about conditions. Um, I, think it, I think it's been in Hungary. Um, I, I would need to check that, but yes, Greta really doing some good work. And I think this highlights that it's not only the, the norms themselves, but actually international law and these treaties that are creating international institutional bodies with a lot of potential. I think this has been um, a little bit underexplored, the role that these uh, institutions could play. African Court of Justice and Human Rights, similar thing there, but again, we need to, uh, time will tell uh, it, its role in that and the way that trafficking has been conceptualized there. So there's certainly a considerable degree of potential in these obligations, but before I turn to international refugee law, I want to take a few moments to look at an apparent conflict within the Palermo Protocol. An obligation which, when applied to the asylum context, appears to actually have the potential to increase the risk and reality of the very thing it aims to combat, namely human trafficking. And that is Article 11 of Palermo Protocol on Border Measures. This contains an obligation to strengthen, to the extent possible, such border controls as may be necessary to prevent and detect trafficking in persons. Also, obligations are placed upon commercial carriers to ensure that only those with adequate visas and travel documents are accepted for travel. Now, in principle, this article could be helpful since it could result in measures being put in place to detect potential or actual victims of trafficking at the border. But it is also potentially problematic and especially so in the asylum context, given what we know about the link between dangerous journeys and trafficking. And the clause has been criticised by other academics as a way in which states can impose tougher immigration controls under the guise of tackling human trafficking. To take this thought further, I want to question if more than just hindering or deterring asylum seekers, might there actually be situations where fulfilling obligations under this article or taking measures and relying on this article as a justification actually results in exposure to greater risk of trafficking among a significant population. 
namely refugees and asylum seekers. And if this is the case, how should it be interpreted? And as many of you know, according to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, treaty provisions must be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning and in their context and in light of the object and purpose. Well, arguably then, given that the object and purpose of the protocol is to prevent trafficking and protect individuals from trafficking, Article 11, it seems to me, would need to be interpreted restrictively and in a way which provides the most protection for all, including refugees. Nevertheless, even with such an interpretation, I would argue that it might still be in some ways impossible to completely reconcile the rationale and results of Article 11 with the overall spirit of the protocol. And that is a problem which is not easily solved, but one which must be acknowledged. Already then at the level of norm content, we see positive aspects and also some concerns from the anti-trafficking framework. So what about refugee and asylum law? Well, we can see the main instruments on the screen here the 1951 convention, the similar counterpart in Africa, and then in, in, in Europe, the EU common European asylum system with a number of instruments. Now, while anti-trafficking law has little to no explicit focus on refugees and asylum seekers, the opposite is true for refugee law. But by assessing this regime through the lens of the problem of trafficking, we can learn valuable lessons about the value of the regime as a whole in doing what it purports to do, which is protect. So the focus in this assessment is really the ways in which these norms, though not directly focused on trafficking, could function to remove or mitigate risk or ways in which they might aggravate risk. So again here, just for the sake of time, the focus is really on the broad themes which emerge. First, refugee and asylum law is centered upon the concept of status in the sense that any protection is connected to that particular status. The question then is, are the substantive parameters of the refugee status and other proactive categories broad enough to ensure that the potential of status as a gateway away from trafficking risk and towards greater protection realised in a meaningful way? Well, if we look into the refugee definition, as we, as we mentioned earlier, there certainly is evidence that there is potential in the various forms of statuses to act as this gateway to protection for a portion of refugees and asylum seekers. And while a status-based system does have some advantages and could work in a way that provides meaningful protection, this only works if, if uh, substantively, substantively it is capable of capturing the full uh, sort of panoply of contemporary reasons for displacement. And with the refugee status, I think it's probably widely known that this is, is not always the case. Um, a key example might be climate change. And as such, uh, many displaced individuals remain at risk and lack the protection of these international guarantees. The broadening of this gateway at the European and African regional level certainly may help, but already at the level of norm content, we see limits to the capacity of refugee law in this regard. Another potential problem are what I conceptualize as access gaps. So this lack of explicit binding commitments to grant uh, access to territory for asylum. And although UNHCR continues to point out Article 14 of the Universal Declaration, soft law instrument, the lack of binding commitments it still, still stands out. And when it comes to access to territory, um, these gaps and weaknesses could be seen as red flags or warning signs of the potential of states to enact policies that could deter those who need protection. Uh, Gamble of Hansen and Hathaway have noted, and I quote, the developed world has expanded considerable energy in trying to find ways to prevent claims for protection being made at their borders. And if that is the case, then gaps within refugee law as regards access are even more troubling. I also look at my research at whether, you know, this promised land of whenever we're in the country of asylum, you know, what protections are there and is it really the promised land of protection? Look a little bit more at about after asylum decision and what, if anything, international refugee law says there. Um, but I just finally want to touch on, again, the role of these institutional actors. In particular, I just want to focus on UNHCR, which I see as occupying a unique space in the international plane, in the sense that sometimes it takes on the roles of states, sometimes it's creating norms, sometimes it's interpreting norms, a really, really interesting creation of international law. And again, like Greta, a place with considerable potential to make these valuable connections um, between trafficking and asylum and, and what these laws mean. So again, the role of these actors created by international law shouldn't be overlooked um, by just looking at the substantive content.
very, very briefly then, international human rights law. Um, as many of you will be aware, numerous instruments, too many to list here, um, protecting civil and political rights, economic, social and cultural rights, children's rights, women's rights and more. That is also true at the European and African regional level. And what about human rights law's role in addressing uh, trafficking in the asylum context? Well, I think the nature is a little bit more different here. It's broad in scope. It's not necessarily based on status in the same way that refugee law and trafficking is. Um, it's, you know, obviously there are norms that apply only for children or women, but it's, it's that focus on status and um, it's more universal. And in that sense, it does offer considerable potential to capture some of the gaps that we've identified. There's also you know, widespread proliferation of instruments at international and regional levels and a wide range of judicial and quasi-judicial enforcement mechanisms, monitoring mechanisms. And really, I know these, these mechanisms are often criticized um, for their weaknesses, but I think it's more important also for us to look at what they can do and what role they could have in making these valuable connections and interpreting you know, how some of these norms can apply to the problem of trafficking in the asylum context. I do also think it's worth noting that in the asylum context, international human rights law has been described by Shatai as the main normative frame. And while you may not agree with that, um, I think it's obvious now that we can't really look at asylum issues without looking at human rights law. And I would say the same for human trafficking, this growing recognition of a need for a rights-based approach. So in a way, International human rights law can be this umbrella, in a sense, that 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 brings this this whole thing together and helps to create those connections between uh, trafficking, international anti-trafficking law, and international asylum law. Just very briefly, a few things that I look at in my assessment of rights law, and um, when it comes to this problem, extraterritorial jurisdiction. So the idea, if we take this gateway to protection a little bit further, the idea that there might be a possible to exit risk earlier in the sense that at times we have seen, um, and this is especially true in the European Convention and from the European Court of Human Rights, but not only, also the Human Rights Committee very recently, um, adding to this concept of extraterritorial jurisdiction. In a sense, the time, if we, if we even think of it in a temporal aspect, the time when um, rights are triggered is earlier. And I think that can only be a good thing when we, when we know what we know about risk. Um, within asylum journey. So not perfect and of course often disputed, but could be um, something that could strengthen protection. Substantive pr protection then in, in human rights law. I mean, there are lots of examples. I've just picked two here. So the prohibition of slavery, servitude and forced labour. Again, the European Court of Human Rights has been uh, increasingly um, sort of drawing out, uh, for example, that trafficking falls within the scope of that prohibition and also just drawing out um, given real clarity to some of those um, obligations that are contained within, for example, Article 4 of the European Convention. non refoulement obligations as well within the prohibition of ill treatment, really important developments in refugee law. I think there's a lot of work to be done there in terms of their capacity to also capture trafficking risk. And I think that's probably, you know, untapped potential in, in those obligations as well. And again, monitoring and enforcement for all the weaknesses that we know of. I think there is a strength there. In terms of complaints being brought, I mean, U UN Committee Against Torture, one that um, many of you will know has been has been very relevant in the um, realm of refugee and asylum, uh, Human Rights Committee, and these other other committees, um, very very important um, as well. I'm just going to skip past this interactions uh, section because I see I'm running out of time a little bit, but we can come back to this in uh, the discussion. Very briefly, then on the domestic plane, um, you know the, the the assessment that I that I have done on content, scope, and interpretation, and um, we can see that international law does have the capacity to play a positive role in addressing trafficking in the asylum context, and this is especially so when the separate frameworks are considered together. But there are gaps to be found that could potentially exacerbate the risk. And just looking at the the domestic plane, which I, I do look at um, in my in my research. In terms of the countries that I draw on, it was key to strike a balance which was broad enough to reflect some of the diversity across the regions. So I draw on examples from EU and non-EU countries, a mix of legal systems, a range of diverse countries across Africa. And on the screen here, you can see just some of the themes that I've investigated during this domestic level analysis. And I'll just touch on two of them. First, 
I think in the findings, we can see what I would call a strong normative force of status elements of the framework within the domestic system. This can be seen by widespread adoption of the trafficking definition and the refugee definition across diverse cultures and contexts. And while there may be nuance in how it is applied, certainly how it is conceived and those parameters seem to really have permeated across cultures and contexts, really interesting. But it also means that both the strengths and the weaknesses of these statuses really have quite a strong impact. Another observation we see on the domestic level is that policies of deterrence could certainly do seem to be aggravating risk. These are somewhat more common in Europe, but not exclusively so. And they do appear to fill the access gaps which we identified in the overall international framework and perhaps are exacerbated by things such as border measures clauses that have pointed out in the trafficking framework. I do also look at living conditions and also life after asylum decision and how that is worked out in the domestic plane. So finally, tying this all together, what sort of picture is emerging from my research about the role of international law? Obviously, this is limited to two regions and um, a number of countries within those regions, but I think we can get some trends that will be interesting to test elsewhere. One key takeaway is that we do see the normative force of international norms playing a role against across, sorry, diverse contexts. And this comes back to my argument that content matters. It matters what's there, it matters how it's interpreted, and it matters the direction that it's going in. This is particularly true when it comes to norms which create status, um, as I've highlighted previously. Another key takeaway, which I hope I've highlighted a bit through the presentation, is the role of actors created by international law. So when we're talking about the role of international law, it's easy to focus on substance, but also I think looking at these actors that international law creates and their capacity to enhance protection and make some of those valuable connections that need to be done. There's evidence of really good practice of this. And again, for all the criticisms of these actors, I think there's a lot of untapped potential and really worthwhile investigating the role that these actors could have. Another thing I think is really interesting is how much citizen engagement with international law makes a difference. And that's really a question rather than a statement. So if we think of um, international human rights law complaint mechanisms, um, I think of Benabib and her work on democratic iterations and this engagement with um, the language of rights. I think it's really interesting when we look at complaint mechanisms in international law that is like human rights committee, compared to how many states have ratified that protocol, the complaints seem to emerge from within a limited number of states. And I wonder if that has any impact on the effectiveness of international law within a domestic system. So really, really interesting um, sort of picture emerging there too. Finally, we see throughout international law, perhaps even at its core, this tension between sovereignty and protection. And I think we can, we can see state practice in this way as well. And I would say this tension is unlikely to be easily resolved. So I would suggest that while international law in some ways in these areas reinforces this tension, in other ways, it could actually be a tool to help navigate that tension. That's really what I'm interested in is sort of how this could be best done. So I'll leave it there. Um, thank you very much for your attention. And I will hand it back. I'll stop sharing and hand back to Breed for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Super, thanks Gillian. Um, that was a really interesting presentation. And so for everybody watching us on Facebook, you're very welcome to submit your questions in the comments box below the video and I'll pass them on to Gillian as they come in. And in the meantime, I have some questions for you, Gillian. Um, so if I, if I can start, um, first thing I'd be interested in is you spoke a little bit about the risk factors of, of someone who might be trafficked. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Um, so, you know, bearing in mind the caveat you said before about there's there's reasons that we, very good reasons why we don't have data and why it's difficult to collect data, but what would be a typical sort of profile or experiences of somebody who might um, end up being trafficked? And then secondly, and I'll remind you of these questions if, because there's there's a, a few of them um, if, if, you, if you don't get if you don't get to remember them all. Um, the second one is, where does this tend to happen? Again, bearing in mind your caveats on, on data, you gave very good um, legal reasons why Europe and Africa are your case studies and that they have different regional laws and a diverse mix of um, legal systems and things like that. But mm. um, 
is this truly a, a global problem or are there specific regions where it's 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 um worse than the other and finally um to what extent is there quite a direct overlap between these two legal regimes so on what if if on what ground could somebody argue that if if you know, they, they present themselves say in the united kingdom they're making a claim for international protection and they say their main grounds is if you send me back i'm going to be trafficked so to what extent is there a direct you know link there between the trafficking harm and claiming refugee status is it persecution to be trafficked um would it be membership of a particular social group to be a trafficked person so those are my my three questions and i very much encourage anybody else to please submit questions through the facebook comments box thanks julian thanks very much and um, yeah really really interesting questions and on risk factors i mean yes i didn't i didn't really go into it um and it, it is really diverse there's a lot of research out there and um, not necessarily in in refugee law um, and not necessarily in legal research at all. Um, a lot of you know human geography type research that I've come across, loads of different types of research that, that try to trace risk factors. I mean, in the Palermo Protocol, one of the, the articles on prevention actually mentions some risks such as uh, underdevelopment, lack of opportunity, poverty. Um, I mean, I don't know uh, how much research, you know, those were based on, but I think research would definitely show those. I think, in, in the research I've done, I would say not all migration is a risk factor, but we do see some kinds of migration as a risk factor and what I would call risky migration of which um, taking an asylum journey. Obviously, if you think of things like poverty, lack of opportunity and all those kind of things, they all converge in an asylum journey. I think when you add in smuggling and lack of access to safe and legal routes, I think it, it, in, in many ways it's a, it's a perfect uh, melting point, perfect in the sense of it's, a, it's not a good situation, but in terms of all those risk factors coming together, I think it's really, really a concerning. I think it's a high level of risk. There are other, um, there are other, if anybody is interested, sort of really interesting researches out there. The, the name of the author has escaped me, but I there's a really interesting quantitative research. I know I've just said the seductions of quantification, and now I, I, I go to promote one, but um, she, she has looked at um, different factors that are present um, when a trafficking case has been identified. Now, this is not necessarily in the asylum context, but things like a country's percentage of agricultural workers comes up really, really high. Um, and, and actually in the agricultural sector, we do see a lot of trafficking. That's not slightly, that's not as connected to the asylum process, but very, very interesting research in terms of where we see risk. And even that dominant narrative that still persists as, as to who a trafficked person is, um, and in particular the dominance of sex trafficking, but actually forced labour and even gendered assumptions about trafficking, if we look at risk, um, and I think just those kind of findings about agricultural workers, I think are important because um, often, you know, people who are asylum seekers who are trying to make, make a new lives for themselves, they might end up working in an informal economy or, or in agricultural sectors. So I think it's important to even know those risk factors for, for those moments of after the asylum, uh, decision and, and not to forget that risk is is there too. Um, you had asked, is this a global problem or um, just in Africa and Europe? I, I would say, you know, when I start looking at this in, in my research, I do look at it more globally. So there's a focus on Africa and Europe, but we see this. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't extensively researched, you know, in depth across the globe, but I think there's certainly indications across the globe. And I mean, these same patterns of, of exclusion and deterrence. I mean, if we look, for example, at the US-Mexico border, we see a number of, of, of kind of red flags of risk there too. Um, and again, you know, reliance on smuggling, lack of access to, to safe and legal routes. I think one of the things that's quite interesting about Europe and Africa is there's obviously flows within those um, continents, but I think there's also um, a connection between them and that a lot of people from Africa are trying to get to Europe um, for, for one reason or another. It could be language, family reasons, um, many other reasons. Some, some individuals, and this is a little bit beyond the asylum context, are probably deceived or tricked, but there is a flow going um, it, it, mainly in one direction uh, between those two continents. Um, so I think that links those two continents in terms of that problem. But I would say 
um, without having extensively researched, you know, every region in the world that yes, this is a problem globally. And I think it's probably because of the way in which asylum journeys often happen and the, the sort of conflation between that and what we know as risk factors for trafficking and exploitation. Um, your third question about a direct, just remind me that was about, is there a direct overlap between the legal? The, sure, exactly. So to what extent could someone claim um, as you know, making an asylum claim, argue that if they're, they have a real risk of being trafficked in their in their country of nationality. So is there an overlap, for example, with, you know, is, is human trafficking a form of persecution or is being a trafficked person a member of a particular social group? There are two possible overlaps I can think of. Maybe there's more, or maybe they're not overlaps at all. So I'd appreciate your, your views on that. Yeah, I mean, they are overlaps. And, and actually, whenever, um, whenever I'd sort of started looking at my PhD research, most of the research that I, I find in practice about the sort of overlap between trafficking and refugees, that's normally what it was about. So Stoyanova's done some work on this, um, a couple of others who, who you know, talk about these almost like complementary frameworks. And um, also there is a bit of work on, you know, could, could trafficking be persecution? Is it membership of a particular social group? Exactly those questions you've asked. Is it gender? It, it, it possibly depends. It depends on the trafficking uh, experience, I would say. My understanding is that at times uh, trafficking is a valid basis uh, for an asylum claim, but not always. So, um, <laughs> you know, it, it could be sufficient, but it, it might not be. And that really depends on what trafficking is. And if we think about the broad definition of trafficking, it can mean so many different things. And actually exploitation doesn't even have to occur for something to be considered trafficking. So I think in practice, my also my understanding in practice, certainly from the UK context and just from from individuals that I know that are working in practice, is that sometimes trafficking, like, like a lot of trafficked persons, are going through both processes at the same time. They're they're going through the NRM and they're going through the asylum process, and and many of them, well, maybe not many of them, but some of them do, are granted asylum on the basis of their trafficking experience. And I, I think that varies from country to country. Um, I know there's a report in the EU context, um, it's maybe a little bit dated now, maybe about 2015, and that looks about whether um, those processes, whether an individual can go through the trafficking process and the asylum process at the same time, whether they have to choose one or another, and whether that assessment is made before, for example, a Dublin removal. So there's, it's complex and it, it differs across countries. Um, and I think it's interesting because I, I have heard some research being presented um, from people who are doing more sort of sociological research my understanding is a lot of these individuals, you know, to them, my understanding is that it, it doesn't really matter what process they're in and uh, often not aware, which I think for us um, as legal academics, it's really important to keep bear in mind that individuals just want to be protected. Um, and, and, you know, in practice, what that looks like um, doesn't always matter. But of course, as we know, there are very, very different um, sort of rationales and underpinnings to those and in particular when it comes to leave to remain so that you know with a traffic person often repatriation of course if they're going to be trafficked back home not not the case but very very different levels of leave to remain and, and just underpinnings of that so sometimes I wonder if there's a bit of a disconnect between um you know the, the legal and the the sort of lived reality um but that's that's a whole other conversation but I think it's definitely interesting to continue these conversations and you know, what does protection mean and, and why are they these different categories of protection, which, as I mentioned, have a really strong normative force in, in domestic countries, really have been widely accepted. Thanks, Gillian. I, I totally agree with you. We can sometimes, especially lawyers, get a bit too tied up in the legal semantics and forget, you know, the most important thing is that that this is these are individuals you're dealing with, with individual situations and circumstances and stories and um you know, trying to box things in sometimes doesn't quite meet the whole aim of what the system was was supposed to achieve in the first place um so we do have a, a question that that's come in from from our audience um so they've praised your presentation thanks a lot for the great presentation and i would like to ask you if you see any impacts of the current covid 19 pandemic on human trafficking and refugee flows and the relevant international legal responses. Um, 
Thank you very much for the question. It's a good question. I, I feel like I can't probably answer it very well in the sense that I think we all expect there to be impacts. And I would say that that kind of research, which I haven't been actively engaged in, is probably just emerging now. As I said, I saw a report from the Council of Europe last week. I mean, I think there's definitely, um, and, and, and probably Brigitte maybe even know more, more of it than me, but there's definitely some research emerging about, you know, the impact of border closures. And I would imagine that that has aggravated trafficking um, among, the, among those flows, but I don't have any, you know, um, objective sort of um, peer reviewed research to back that up. I'm sure it is out there. I, I would imagine just given what we know about risk, dangerous journeys, impact of border closures, and how accessing asylum has been even more difficult, um, in COVID, I would imagine that that it has been a problem. And I think, like a lot of things with COVID, I think we'll only start to see the real impact and fallout of that really in, in the years to come. Um, during you know the height of, of, the, of the first wave, um, as I said, UNHCR were really calling on states not to close their borders. They were, they were reminding them of their obligations, but uh, as we know, it, it's complex. So as I say, I don't know any research offhand that is, about that aggravated risk but I would suspect um I would be very surprised if it hadn't had a detrimental effect on trafficking among refugees and asylum seekers which is really really unfortunate. Thanks Gillian um so another another question for you you mentioned that the there isn't a border crossing requirement in order for someone to be considered as a trafficked person but is there any geographical threshold, for example, if someone was moved from one part of a city to another part of a city, would that qualify as, as trafficking? Well, this is this is the big question. Um, and I think one thing that I didn't touch upon is I would say that while we have clarity on the elements of the trafficking definition, the conceptual boundaries of that definition are still very much contested. Um, there are, I know some out there who would probably even contest my um, assertion that we don't need a transnational element. Um, happy to see that the European Court of Human Rights has, has recently very definitively said, at least for the purposes of Article 4, that you know transnational or domestic trafficking, and um, that we don't need a border crossing. And I think that is becoming more and more accepted, but it's not universal. In terms of how far someone would need to be, um, I mean, I would say, I, I do take a very broad approach to the concept of human trafficking, but I'm aware that, that others don't. Um, this is still to be uh, decided. And I think uh, this is the kind of conceptual work that needs to be done on the trafficking definition. Is it, you know, and I know there's 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 some people, I mean, uh, Sean Elaine, he writes about there's no effective trafficking definition when we look in the domestic uh, systems because everybody's talking about different things. And I, I would say that we all, I would say there's a large part of what, what we consider human trafficking that everybody agrees on. It's that stuff on, on the periphery that, you know, is unclear. I certainly would say it is, but, you know, it's questions like, well, what is harboring? You know, is it is it keeping someone for an hour, for a day, for a week? Um, and of course, we all we all know there's probably some degree of continuity that, that probably needs to be with it, but it's not clear. And um, so I would say, yes, you know, there doesn't need to be much geographical um say distance in it but i'm aware that others would dispute that and if if, the, if that individual's interested there's a lot of really good um and interesting discussion out there um and really discussion that needs to continue thanks Gillian. i think that wraps it up very nicely with us with the pandora's box of lots of other major issues that come out of your thesis project but with, not within the scope of your PhD so you don't have to deal with them but yeah. maybe um, people who are watching today will be interested in following up uh, on those questions so that brings us just in time just under the hour I'd like to thank Gillian very much for sharing her research with us here today and to Teresa for helping us with all of the admin and just supporting us in moving our seminars online which is new for for both of us yeah. so we'll leave it at that and you're welcome to watch the video in future um, it'll be recorded and made available online thank you for joining us and we hope to see you at another one of the Centre for International Laws events very soon Take care and have a nice afternoon.